I thought you were going first. No, you're going to introduce this. The topic? What? This is the panel. All right, everybody, welcome to the workshop, or the round table, I should say, although it's not round at all, it is uh, decidedly rectangular. Welcome to the round table on the nature of digital sovereignty and internet fragmentation. So we uh, are going to start on time because we have a, uh, a somewhat large round table and we're hoping to have a lot of free-flowing exchanges of ideas. Uh, so I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists and uh, ourselves and uh, then we will get underway with Bill uh, offering a disquisition on the nature of sovereignty, which will take uh, less than five minutes. And uh, then I will get my turn to do the same thing and then we will uh, have a set of questions. Uh, we have tried to break down the topic into four parts. Number one, we're going to talk about the nature of national sovereignty and its extension to digital sovereignty in general terms, in abstract terms. And in part two, we're going to talk about the national effects of digital sovereignty, how it affects human rights and the security and privacy and so on. Three, we're going to talk about the global effects of digital sovereignty, whether it's compatible with the global internet, et cetera. And finally, we're going to talk about the governance responses uh, regarding uh, how we should uh, deal with this tension between sovereignty and uh, cyberspace. So, I am uh, Dr. Milton Mueller. I'm a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology and the director of the Internet Governance Project. Uh, to my immediate left here is uh, Dr. William Drake, who is a professor at the uh, University of Zurich in the Department of Media and Communication. Studies. Studies, yes. Um, let's see, going from uh, my left to the right, we have uh, Ambassador Achilles Zalwar of Brazil, and we all know that Brazil has been uh, one of the leaders in raising issues uh, regarding sovereignty and cyberspace, in, in, going back to the days of the World Summit. Next to him, we have uh, Dr. Peixi Xu, or Xu Peixi, as they say in Chinese, um, and he is a professor at the Communication University of China in Beijing. Uh, then <laughs> we have Lisa Furr, and I'm unclear as to whether you are still at Etno. You are still at Etno. Okay. Okay. European Telecommunications Numbering Organization, where you are the director, if I'm not mis Secretary. Director General. So she's not a sergeant or a private, she's the Director General of the Etno. Okay, now going to my right, we have Alexander Isavnin who was with the Internet Protection Society of Russia. And in fact, we have two Russians on the panel. Uh, the other one is Ilona Stadnik, who is a PhD candidate at St. Petersburg University. And uh, Russia is a particularly interesting contributor to the dialogue on sovereignty and the internet because of their uh, recent policies and actions. And then, last but not least, we have Mona Bondran, who is a professor at the American University no. Cairo University in Egypt, and she specializes in economics and international trade. All right, everybody set as to who we are? Now let me turn it over to Bill to introduce the topic. Okay, thank you, Milton, and hello, everybody. So, uh, who? Vint. Vint. Oh, yeah, who's Vint? Who's that guy, Vint? There's this gentleman named Surf over on the other end of the table who's also with us from Google. Um, okay, so yes, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, so as the resident political scientist on this panel, I feel compelled to start by saying that we live in an anarchic international system, a system characterized by an absence of any centralized political authority, therefore authority devolves down to the level of nation states, and that is the origin of the nature of national sovereignty. 
Under international law, it's worth remembering that sovereignty simply means the states are not formally subject to any other sources of legitimate political authority. Uh, sovereignty has an external or horizontal dimension, which is that states are jurisdic jurisdictionally separate and equal and enjoy the same rights and privileges as each other and are not bound by any higher supranational authority. And an internal or vertical dimension, which is, says that essentially nation states are hierarchically organized and states are at the top and have supreme authority over their societies with regard to imposing ta laws and taxes, raising armies, things like that. Sovereignty does not require any particular kind of policies. This is important to remember. Liberal capitalist countries, state socialist countries, and everything in between are equally sovereign despite their varying laws, regulations, and ways of dealing with the internet and the digital environment. Nevertheless, from a sort of constructivist standpoint, you could say that sovereignty is what states make of it. And states have always construed or claimed to believe that certain cross-border flows of information, people, money, etc., originating from other actors threaten their sovereignty in some way and require strong status responses. This has been configurative of the history of global communications ever since the Treaty of Dresden of 1850, which was the first multilateral agreement on international electronic communications. All international regimes that have been created to deal with telecom, radio, broadcasting, satellites, and so on, have been characterized by these kind of strong and expansive interpretations of what sovereignty meant and what sovereignty allowed states to do. Uh, invoking sovereignty is like playing the joker card in a card game. Uh, you throw it down and it trumps all other considerations uh, and it ends all discussions, much like security in some respects. It's easily deployed to rally nationalist sentiment, you could say even tribal, tribal sentiment, and position the state as the necessary defender and rightful beneficiary of unquestioned loyalty. We now see this same expansive approach to sovereignty that's characterized communications historically being applied to the internet. The original internet vision of a transnational space with end-to-end -end exchange of packets among willing endpoints is being now treated to the wonders of a vertically segmented pattern of political authority uh, in which states seek to sort of divide the internet into mutually exclusive sorts of territorially based domains. And of course, we're all very familiar with uh, the position that's been advocated by China uh, very uh, aggressively about cyber sovereignty, the Russian internet seg segment and the sovereign RU, uh, what's been done in Cuba, North Korea, et cetera. But of course, we also see that this discourse is now being picked up in the Western world as well to justify a wide range of policies, whether it's uh, Madame Merkel or Madame van der Leyen, um, the, the language of sovereignty is becoming um, very deeply ingrained in discussions of the internet and the digital environment um, throughout the world, um, which raises some real questions. Uh, it's interesting for those of us who've been around a long time and remember the WISIS and everything, everything since then, for, for many years, people in the multi-stakeholder internet governance uh, environment were trying to limit the encroachment of sovereignty-based models uh, at the national and intergovernmental level into uh, areas of internet governance where they might not be necessary. Yet today, some stakeholders seem to embrace various constructions of sovereignty as a necessary antidote to the dangers of GAFA and other types of things. Um, and this often involves suspending any concerns regarding states and their actions. So we've ended up in a situation where we have a fairly polarized and unproductive kind of conversation about the digital sovereignty, cyber sovereignty, etc. But clearly this is a growing phenomena. Clearly we may be at sort of an inflection point in the evolution of government policies towards the internet space. And so today that's what we want to consider. What actions are being taken under the, the justification or label of preserving national sovereignty and how might those kinds of uh, policies impact at the national and the global level uh, with regard to the internet. You go ahead and do the first segment and I'll introduce my thoughts at the governance response. Okay, so innovating on the fly. Um, so we will then just begin with the first uh, little bit of discussion. We, if we have four 15 minute segments as we talked about. So we're gonna start with the notion of uh, the nature of national sovereignty and its extension to digital sovereignty or cyberspace sovereignty. And our lead uh, respondents here are Peji and Ilana and Ambassador uh, Saldwar. So let's start with 
a few sort of general concerns. What does sovereignty really mean in the digital or cyber context to you? Is digital sovereignty compatible with globalized access provided by internet protocols? What do we gain, what do we lose by trying to make cyberspace conform to notions of territorial sovereignty? And how does sovereignty in cyberspace relate to or differ from traditional notions of sovereignty that we've had in international communications? So let's, that's the kind of nexus we want to get into first. What is digital sovereignty about? What claims are being made about it? What are the costs and benefits of it? Why don't we start with uh, Thank you, Bill. Uh, Professor Xu from Communication University of China. I touch upon these questions in a rather personal way. Uh, I see this uh, rather challenging because uh, a lot of nations and individuals like nice words. They all support, for example, freedom, and they all support the free flow somehow. So it's important to, to observe how they make exceptions to it. China has this uh, uh, social stability exceptions. You ha U.S. has uh, national security exceptions, and the EU has perhaps uh, privacy exceptions. Uh, so it's important to look at these details and also uh, I uh, would like to, since there's a very wide representation of different countries uh, with uh, Russia, uh, Brazil, and also, by the way, Egypt and EU, uh, uh, Milton and uh, Bill and uh, Vinton, uh, uh, they are globalists. They don't have a motherlands. But anyhow, I will also observe how China looks at this uh, uh, this uh, topic in different contexts. So I have these uh, different categories. Category number one is a military, in which uh, the, uh, I, from a Chinese perspective, I see uh, there is a most uh, hardcore extension of a national sovereignty into the cyberspace, which should be viewed the most in you know, the most negative way. And uh, uh, under such a context. Uh, uh, China, for example, remains uh, reluctant to admit uh, that uh, the cyberspace is a military zone. Uh, but still, China uh, promotes national sovereignty in such a context against the possibility that national sovereignty might be used uh, to, uh, for aggressive purposes by some other nations. So it's rather paradoxical. Uh, situation. The next uh, category is a cyber crime. Uh, again, uh, it's a sovereignty story, uh, but there are a lot of transnational initiatives and a mechanism in store. The EU has uh, Budapest, Russia has uh, a convention against information crimes, and uh, the United States and the UK signed the first data sharing agreement. Uh, China follows a rather practical way, uh, busy with uh, catching cyber criminals from abroad committing telecommunication fraud, and uh, cyber crime is the biggest crime in China, which is also happy news because uh, it reduced the crime on the street. Mm -hmm. So the second uh, category, uh, the third category is uh, about uh, uh, trade, and the most recent opposite is Osaka Declaration, and uh, I think I look forward to perhaps the prohibition of uh, the data localization practices in this uh, uh, context. And China, I think, uh, up, uh, uh, supports the free flow in this uh, particular category. And when turning to uh, the technical communities and uh, the uh, management of uh, core internet resources, I think uh, uh, this is where institutional uh, innovation really happens and uh, has the value to be exported to some other categories to inform other categories. And China is a strong supporter, by the way, of mighty stakeholdership in this category. And the president uh, keeps uh, talking about this for five years, though the voice uh, are not very much heard. Uh, and uh, uh, the values, by the way, uh, of the technical community is also wider shared, uh, rooted into Chinese culture. And then uh, talking about, uh, for example, content, I think China has a rather sovereign 
approach about the content and the human rights standards in such a, a category. Uh, but the good news is this, if you look inward, there is a diversity of media ownership in China brought about uh, by the internet. So you have, uh, I mean, we have a grassroots media ownership represented by this uh, microblogging accounts and uh, uh, by the way, the WeChat accounts, we have, of course, the state ownership of the media, but still we see the rise of a private media ownership like TikTok and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is a quite uh, reassuring. So I provide this uh, different context and how uh, national sovereignty is extended into the context. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's turn from a Chinese view to a Russian view. Ilana, what do you, what do you have to say about these opening questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to to speak maybe about some theoretical uh, uh, theoretical parts of this question and to point to a very particular term. So sovereignty is always about territory. It's always about specific borders that uh, define this particular territory. And if we speak from the uh, uh, viewpoints of uh, political science or international relations, it's always uh, the ability of particular authority to exercise this authority over this territory. And when we speak about digital sovereignty, um, it's a tricky term because sometimes we just uh, perceive it as something negative, as Bill told uh, in the opening remarks. But Basically, this is just the uh, intention of states to exert authority regarding the digital things, right? Um, uh, and uh, there is always a big temptation to treat cyberspace uh, uh, like uh, high seas or airspace or water space, because obviously there are no physical borders, but still states uh, find some ways how to uh, decide how to tackle with uh, regulation of uh, use of these uh, global commons, right? But cyberspace is a bit different. Uh, it's interconnected. Uh, it's technically interconnected. And uh, when we speak about sovereignty as independent uh, policy development and in, in implementation um, uh, uh, towards some for example, content, uh, data control, or infrastructure control and protection. It's really hard to be very independent because of the nature of the network itself. So, um, for me, digital sovereignty is a constructed term. So, uh, it's, it's like an intention to, uh, to signify for states uh, a new domain for their uh, uh, powers for uh, assertion of their powers, but uh, probably it's just a play of terms. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you. It's always nice to hear constructivism mentioned. Um, uh, Ambassador, your thoughts from Brazil. Thank you, Milton. Uh, I'm speaking on a personal capacity. I think it's more interesting and uh, more in tone with the, what the IGF uh, is. Uh, there is a kind of uh, elephant in the room in this debate that a uh, few people mention in public, it, which is the fact that the internet with capital I was already born sovereign. It was the creation of a military research project from the sovereign government of the United States of America. We must all be grateful to our American friends for that. It was a great demonstration of technological and organizational ingenuity. And I tip my hat to Vint Cerf, who is, there, who is here, and who took part in it from the beginning. A quarter of a century later, the internet uh, became a sort of global utility, like the global postal system in the 19th century, or the telecom global telecommunication system in the 20th century. The internet is the 21st century equivalent. We don't need to go back to the debate about creating some sort of uh, world internet organization that would have managed this global utility. Uh, many of us were on opposite sides of the debate, and uh, it didn't work. Uh, the outcome is that the internet today is both sovereign and global. It is sovereign because control, at least indirect control, over the critical infrastructure of the internet is still under the sovereign authority of our American friends. ICANN, which has had its sixth CIF meeting a few weeks ago in Montreal, 
is a non-profit organization, non-profit corporation registered in the wonderful state of California, not far from where this adventure began in Silicon Valley. If anyone runs the internet, ICON and the digital mega platforms do. This has benefits. Nobody questions the technical soundness of the protocols and servers that form the backbone of the internet. But it also has its inconvenient side. We could point out to the recent decisions on the dot .amazon and dot .org cases. Monopolies are being granted to private companies in the dot .amazon case against the objection of the communities and governments concerned, who represent the public interest, and in the dot .org case without meaningful public, public debate. Well, so much for the sovereign side. The global dimension of the internet, on the other hand, is reflected here at IGF and in exercises such as the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Can, should, must we have an IGF plus? What would be its powers, if any? In the past, at uh, WISES and at Net Mundial, we were able to agree on some principles. I will quote, selectively, in the interest of time. Open, participative, consensus-driven governance, inclusive and equitable decision-making, meaningful participation by all stakeholders, respect for the respective rights and responsibilities of all stakeholders, including uh, governments as wardens of public policy concerns, as well as civil society, businesses, international organizations, and the technical and scientific community. In light of the cases I just mentioned and other controversies, have we lived up to these principles? My impression is that if we did, we would not have had to go through the exercise of the high-level panel. Current challenges to internet regulation may well lead us to regret the decline in the application of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. There is a growing demand for regulation, for instance, related to data protection standards, brought about by concerns related to the application of artificial intelligence and surveillance technologies to big data, either by governments or by a few monopolistic companies. Convergent technologies bring about the perspective of economic and welfare gains, but also they bring concerns related to cybersecurity, including the vulnerability of critical infrastructure to terrorism and other forms of hostile action. Freedom of expression is threatened by algorithm censorship, both by states and by monopolistic companies in charge of social networks, search engines, digital retail, and other data mining, data mining enterprises. At the same time, national political debate takes place more and more in global virtual media. So the old rules about sovereignty interference come under stress. These are mostly questions. I can't say I have already made answers to them. Uh, if I take the floor again, I may give uh, one or two ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was very provocative. In fact, indeed, we have a couple of minutes before we turn to the next question, so I can't let go of the fact that uh, the ambassador has suggested that uh, the internet was born sovereign uh, and was a creature of a sovereign state from the outset. I wonder if any of our other panels, and Vint, I'm kind of looking at you, um, panelists might like to respond to that provocative uh, concept to start. I'd be yeah? happy to start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the interesting fact is that the design of the Internet was born sovereign in the sense that Bob Kahn and I released that design freely for anyone to use. And we said, if you can build an, an, a network that behaves this way and find someone to connect to, it should work. And that was about as far as we went. Um, different networks were built by different organizations inside the U.S., um, our research agencies like the Department of Energy and NSF and others built their own uh, backbone networks and interconnected them. Research networks were uh, created in other parts of the world and there was an effort uh, by NSF on the U.S. side to uh, build international connections so that those research networks could be interconnected and share information. In, that, uh, early, in the early days, the idea of free flow of information arose largely out of the academic exchange of information since most of the users of the internet prior to its uh, commercial incarnation were uh, researchers and academics. Uh, and another portion of the net was carved off to be uh, something in support of the U.S. Defense Department. So it, to that extent, I, I would understand the uh, assertion that the internet was born 
sovereign in the sense that anyone who wished to participate was free to do that. No one dictated whether anyone participated or not, and no one dictated who connected and under what terms and conditions. My guess is that the ambassador's use of sovereign is a little different from yours. Uh, but actually, no, why don't you jump yeah, in? Maybe we, should, maybe we should try to sort out that. Yes, uh, let's, that. let's do that. So there's actually two meanings of sovereignty. The original debate about Internet sovereignty took place in the mid-'90s when uh, John per Perry Barlow declared in his declaration of the independence of cyberspace that the cyberspace was a sovereign space on its own. And I think that's what you mean when you say it was open source and freely available and non-proprietary protocol, it was, a, it was a thing unto itself. It was not under the sovereignty of a territorial state. Is that kind of what you're uh, saying? No, no, uh, no state claimed it, and, uh, and it didn't look for a claim. It simply said, if you want to participate, you're free to do so. And I think Ambassador Zellwar is saying the exact opposite, that because it was developed by the US military, that it was a sovereign output or product or control by the U.S.? If the implication was that the U.S. developed this for the purposes of controlling it, uh, I would beg to differ because uh, we didn't do that. We handed it out freely. Would you like to synthesize a little bit more and then turn to the next question? Well, I think we have um, a variety of interesting responses here. I, I like uh, what uh, Ilona said about uh, this is fundamentally a digital sovereignty is kind of a, a an attempt, uh, an assertion by governments as part of an attempt to assert their authority in, in cyberspace. I think that um, uh, what Professor Xu said uh, in some ways uh, supported that, that he is interestingly saying that China does not want to uh, recognize cyberspace as a military domain. But on the other hand, when it comes to content, they do want to assert authority over that, and therefore they do take more of a sovereignty approach. Uh, and the same with trade and data localization. I think we'll get into this a little deeper when we go to the next part of our, our questions. And that's where we're talking about the national effects of digital sovereignty. So here we're asking questions by about how countries who assert digital sovereignty or try to create a sovereign internet, how do these affect their citizens? In particular, how do attempts by countries to create a sovereign internet affect the human rights of internet users? How do national boundaries on data flows affect economic development, competition, and efficiency in the global digital economy? And how does sovereignty in cyberspace affect the security and privacy of internet users? So I'm going to begin with Alexander of the Russia Internet Protection Society. What, what do you think about the national effects of so sovereignty? Uh, well, like Ilona mentioned, she was talking about theoretical aspects. So let me talk uh, a little about practical aspects of uh, Russian uh, Internet sovereignty. Uh, first of all, Russian Internet sovereignty law, uh, actually in Russian called Internet Sustainability Law, so its in main intention declared by government is security and sustainability. But what is de facto this law? Previously, uh, Russian Federation tried to have an attempt of control on distribution of internet resources like IP addresses and domain names via mechanisms provided by International Telecommunication Union and have not succeeded. Uh, also, Russia implemented mechanism of enforcing their sovereignty. We already have working mechanism of blocking of unwilled resources. So government can enforce its own sovereignty. Previously, personal data of Russian citizens was declared as sovereign. Um, Russia declared sovereignty over personal data of Russian citizens. So for this reasoning, LinkedIn is now blocked in Russia because it does not respect, from view uh, point of government, uh, this part of sovereignty. Uh, this law which we are mentioning uh, actually can, gives government right to control relations between holders of internet resources. Nothing more yet by laws are being written, but it's a first attempt to control relations between holders of, of autonomous system numbers, holders of IP addresses, holders of domain names, which government decides need to be sovereign. 
all legislation related to this law is written uh, in completely technical language. So it's technical regulation. And human rights protecting organization just does not react to this. Russia is not declaring uh, the, its will to violate human rights, perform censorship. No, it's just technically regulated. But de facto, how previous regulation and this regulation will work, it will, con it will control the flow of information. It will control possibility of Russian users to access information government would or would not like. It will control, uh, it will lock uh, all uh, users' activities for the purposes of security, for sure, by government. So it will even government have possibility, again, it could not declare efficiently its will to violate human right. But de facto, it will have such possibility. Will it use it? For sure, as we've seen on the previous rounds uh, of uh, consequences of previous rounds of internet regulation. Also, there is a question about how it will affect national boundaries. Uh, Responsibility of, of internet number resources declared by these legislations uh, landlocks Russian ISPs inside Russia. So, for example, if I, Russian ISPs wants to connect to internet exchange, it needs to connect only to registered internet exchange. So that's definitely, uh, I'm not sure that DECIX or AMSEX will register under this law because they will need to follow rules of national security of Russian Federation, like performing all data to FSB. What, what will be consequences? We don't know yet. But we hope that uh, in this case, we hope for traditional Russian corruption, that all money will be, <laughs> all money for realization of this law will be stolen and will de facto will not have working sovereignty. This is a, a, a beautiful uh, a twist on the sovereignty theme. Uh, <laughs> But I think you starkly laid out some of the, what you think are the consequences of digital sovereignty for national uh, citizens uh, of, of your country. Now let's turn more to the economic dimension and I'll go first to Mona, uh, uh, who is from Egypt and say, uh, as an economist, how do national boundaries on data flows affect economic development, competition, and efficiency in the global uh, digital economy? And then I'll turn to Lisa with the, first, with the same question. Thank you, Professor Miller. Uh, data localization is one of the policies applied to, implement, to reach digital uh, sovereignty. On the one hand, with the advent of the internet and, uh, the fourth in and more, more, more recently the fourth industrial revolution, individuals, businesses, and machines are generating huge amount of data that flows internationally in the global economy. On the other hand, governments have the critical mandate to protect their citizens' privacy, law enforcement, and national security. Mona, could I ask you to slow down a little bit? Uh, some people might have trouble following you. Okay. And a little louder, and a little louder yes. Okay. Thus, governments are increasingly opting to restrict cross-border flow of data with extreme regulatory requirements of data localization. Data localization laws uh, are, um, in, are on an increasing trend, uh, and they are creating uh, virtual borders that lead to internet fragmentation. Uh, we can classify countries according to the strength of measures applied by, by them to protect their data. There are countries who have strong measures to protect their data, which is data localization requirements, processing and storage of data in the same country, like in Russia. There are uh, conditional flow of data, uh, like uh, the EU's GDPR and GDPR-inspired laws and, um, uh, by Argentina and Brazil. There is partial measures, like regulations applying only for certain domain names or requiring the consent of individuals before cross-border flow of data, such as in South Korea. And there is sector-specific data localization requirements, such as in health sector in Australia and banking and financial sector in India and Turkey. However, internet openness is critical for the private sector in developing countries, especially for SMEs. Allowing free flow of data across borders is strongly correlated with promoting competition, leveling the playing field for SMEs in particular. 
In addition, SMEs, unlike uh, multinational companies, cannot afford to comply with complex laws and stringent data localization requirements. Cross-border flow of data would allow for e-commerce and digital trade, as well as innovations to flourish, especially in developing countries such as Africa, and it would lead to reduce the digital divide. Another important motivation for embracing cross-border flow of data by African countries is the recently announced African Continental Free Trade Area, which, gains, uh, which will lead to gains estimated to about $3 trillion, uh, $3 trillion in GDP growth. It is essential, uh, cross-border flow of data is essential and, uh, and it creates an enabling environment for the newly established trade area in Africa. Recent research findings reveal that developing countries such as African countries are not benefiting from recent technological changes or even the internet as much as developed countries. And this will lead to um, global economic growth is not inclusive and in leads to increase the digital divide. Several factors led to that, among them is, not, is that uh, African countries or developing countries are not having an enabling environment for businesses and not the right regulatory frameworks. For example, if one compares Africa with its 1.2 billion citizens, uh, Africa has, is, only home for, is, is home for only three unicorns, which are companies that are valued are, uh, at more than $1 billion. By contrast, the UK, with just 66 million people, is home of 16 unicorns. So, cross-border flow of data is vital for inclusive growth due to the following reasons. It reduces transaction costs and constraints of distance. It increases organizational efficiencies. It promotes connect, uh, connectivity by increasing the speed of ideas and innovations and economic activities. It reduces barriers to entry for SMEs where they can enter where, um, uh, or plug into global value chains and global digital platforms. It, they can also use big data and big data analytics to allow for creation of new services and to add value to goods exported. Um, digital platform, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, data localization impact the effective provisions of mobile money in Africa as well, where it poses threat to the growth of this sector. It imposes a challenge to the exchange of data with partner remittance companies for customer uh, screening requirements. So it has a negative impact on mobile money and mobile money transfer of remittances in Africa. Finally, I'd like to conclude that uh, McKinsey estimates that uh, cross-border flow of data raised global GDP by approximately 3.5%, which amounts to $2.8 trillion in 2014. Wow, that was a pretty thorough economic analysis of the impact of data localization. Thank you, Mona. And now we'll turn. And there were 16 unicorns in the UK. Right, and I believe in unicorns, especially if they're fluffy. So what... What, uh, Lisa, you're coming at it from a very different perspective. You're a European organization. You're, you're dealing with uh, large suppliers of telecom services. What do you think about this question? Well, thank you, Milton. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting Aetna. And I just want to give a quick introduction to Aetna. Aetna represents the European telecommunication network operators. So my members are uh, European telcos, and we represent 70% of the investment in digital infrastructure. And I'm still the director general, uh, and I uh, hope to remain that. But um, from here, I, I take it from a European perspective. So when we talk about national effects, I will take it from a European perspective because Europe regulates this overall, and um, we look at it from, from the European perspective. I don't know if you know that the new commission has just been approved today. So that is also, of course, very important for the sovereignty that we talk about here today, because the new president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has one of her main uh, goals is to establish a European uh, digital sovereignty. And uh, so all we're talking about is, is digital sovereignty here uh, in, in Europe, and it's very important for all the players. And 
I have another, and this is a personal one, this is not the Edno, I would prefer to call it digital leadership, because I think it's important that we have digital leadership also in, in Europe. So uh, if we look at it and the data uh, regulation that's happening in, in Europe and how that affects the internet, GDPR is a very good example. We have seen GDPR has meant a lot uh, globally. It has established a high level of standards in, in Europe. And I, I don't think it fragmented the, uh, the internet because it was made uh, without uh, discrimination. And this is key here. You are uh, not to set up artificial boundaries. And from our point of view, uh, regulation that actually protects the users uh, is, is important because we need the trust in, in order to have a, a free and, and open uh, internet that works. So from, from my perspective, and here I disagree with uh, the ambassador from Brazil, uh, I actually find that the internet is built as a decentralized system and we want to make sure that it remains a strong and decentralized system that of course operates on a, a set of common rules, but uh, it's, it's a strong uh, because everyone are able to connect uh, to the internet and it should remain that way. To look at it, if it's uh, uh, how uh, the regulation in Europe is affecting uh, economically and, and also on uh, competition and efficiency, uh, there are uh, effects in Europe on the GDPR regulation. If you look at AI, we might have uh, an issue of developing uh, AI because of rules like uh, e-privacy or GDPR. So here, uh, the, the way we, we deal with data and the free flow of data in Europe might have an effect. I, I don't know exactly what the effect is, but it is something that we look into with some concern, of course. We also look into regulation on terrorist content. We look into regulation on a lot of areas. So it's not only on the data, but also on the actual content on the internet. And of course, there is a, a risk when you start making specific rules for a region as big as, as Europe. So from um, a telco side, we uh, strongly support that there are some, some rules, but they need to be made so we're not hampering an internet that is for all. Thank you. Excellent. So um, Bill, do you want to uh, summarize what uh, you heard or shall we move on to the next section? I'd say move on. Okay, so <laughs> next. I mean, Global. I can summarize, but Global. we're starting to run short of time, and I don't. I want to make sure we have enough time for discussion. So my thoughts about this are not so central. I'd like to turn from the national level to the global level, um, and try and get us to think a bit about, in parallel with what was said about uh, the the possibilities that uh, certain kinds of policies adopted in the name of sovereignty might have impacts on human rights, freedoms economic development and so on, to think about what this means in a cumulative systemic way uh, at the international level. For example, is digital sovereignty compatible with the global internet or will it lead to fragmentation of the infrastructure or the services or processes it supports? There's a lot of people talking these days now about splinternet. You see almost daily articles in newspapers and magazines using this term. Apparently we should have trademarked internet fragmentation because that didn't take off as well. Uh, but, um, but a lot of people are saying, you know, that there's, we're seeing a world where there's the US, China, and Europe, and it's like these three big blocks, right? That's the kind of vision that a lot of people are putting forward. It does raise a question, you know, uh, if more and more countries begin to adopt sort of processes and policies that internalize control within their territorial domain, what does this mean for the internet overall? Uh, related question, how do national boundaries impact foreign firms trying to operate locally? Um, are they consistent with international trade obligations and other multilateral obligations that countries may have entered into? And why and how are countries trying to create national internets and how do, how do, they, how do they visualize that interworking with the global internet environment? So 
there's, there's a nexus of different questions here we can ask about the sort of cumulative impacts. Um, so our lead respondents on this one are, are Vint, Lisa, and Ambassador Zaluar. Why don't we start with you, Vint? Uh, you might have some thoughts on this topic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to start out by making uh, the suggestion that the desired normal state of an internet that we would like, or if, uh, if Tim Berners-Lee were here, uh, a web that we would like, is essentially a free flow of data and commerce uh, across uh, this global system. Uh, and that that free flowing system at the same time protect the privacy uh, and safety and security of all who are using uh, this global system. I would like to uh, suggest, possibly for debate, that an international boundary, a boundary between two national jurisdictions, is a little different from the jurisdictional boundaries in a domestic setting. And the difference, I would suggest, is that in a domestic setting, the state has something to say about what uh, the nature of those jurisdictional boundaries. In the United States, we would talk about local uh, uh, law enforcement, for example, and state uh, governance, and then federal governance. And those are the boundaries that are inside the United States are under the control of the United States, whereas the International boundaries are uh, not in control of any one country at all. In fact, that's the whole point about sovereignty. The international boundaries identify a place where uh, country authority applies, and the, the only by agreement uh, across international boundaries will uh, policies apply. Uh, so what we would be looking for, I think, in this global context are policies that are somehow compatible, if not identical, uh, as uh, they get applied as the information flows from one country to another. Uh, what we'd like to do, I think, if we were lucky enough, is to maximize the value of the global span of the internet for everyone's benefit. Mm -hmm. But as you can tell, uh, as the internet has uh, penetrated more deeply uh, into the population of the world, we're also discovering abuses that show up, harms that show up, and we know that those abuses and harms uh, cross international boundaries. And governments uh, have a reasonable response to that, which is to try to protect the safety and security of their citizens and their other infrastructure. Uh, the result is, is an attempt to put some kind of control over the various layers of the internet and I would like to draw your attention to the layered architecture of the network and suggest that some of the um, jurisdictional boundaries and regulatory mechanisms might vary depending on what layer, in which layer, issues arise. And so, for example, many of the issues that are showing up now are way up in the application space, above the level of uh, web-based platforms. Uh, whereas transmission of data across uh, underlying optical fiber networks, for example, or by way of satellite, uh, are uh, the focus of other organizations, satellite carriers, uh, uh, telcos, and things like that. And so the, uh, the layer at which activity takes place might have a great deal to say about what regulatory structure uh, one might be expecting and who might exercise that regulatory uh, constraint. Uh, I would like to draw attention to an earlier meeting today, the Internet and Jurisdiction meeting, where an attempt is being made to make more concrete uh, agreements across those international boundaries in order to help governments cope with what they see as problems they should be solving on behalf of their citizens. And so an example of this is establishing standards for uh, the uh, capture of evidence that's supposed to hold up in court. How do I make sure that integrity is maintained? How do I know what the provenance of the data is? Uh, how do I know under what circumstances data is to be transferred across an international boundary for a legal proceeding? Uh, in, uh, in your next session, you'll be talking about the uh, uh, MLAT process, and so I'm, maybe I will intervene again uh, with your permission there. I'll stop there and say that the problem deserves all of our attention because it's a hard one. But at the same time, I think we're all eager 
to maintain the beneficial value of the free flow of information across the Internet to the degree that we are able to. Okay, thank you, Vin. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, how about you? Uh, thoughts about how uh, the policy is being adopted uh, under the rubric uh, of sovereignty might cumulatively impact at the global level? Thank you. Um, I was thinking about uh, what uh, Vint Cerf just said. Um, and the Internet has had uh, uh, paradoxical effects. Uh, it has led to the formation of uh, global monopolies who benefit from certain effects. Uh, first mover effect, herding effect, scale effect, winner takes all effect, among others. And these effects, uh, uh, intended or unintended, uh, may stifle innovation and may render more insecure the predicament of both of the individual and of national authorities. And on the other hand, the internet enables the existence of a wild, wide variety of niches in which uh, contestant forces, some legitimate, some less legitimate, may enrich public debate, avoiding legacy media oligopolies, and prepare the disruptive innovations of tomorrow, which may lead to the breakup of current monopolies. In this contest uh, cyberscape, the, differentiated and inter the principle of differentiated and interconnected roles of responsibilities of the actors, public, private, or third sector, should allow in principle for a decision-making process in which the evolution of the internet is not determined exclusively or, preponder or preponderantly uh, by a few. Uh, juridical equality among governments, for instance, could reduce the risk of policy capture by monopolistic interests. In practice, however, the differentiation of roles and responsibilities remains uncertain. And each forum, IGF, ICANN, ITU, UNESCO, OCDE, G20, UN, etc., operates according to very diverse and not necessarily coherent sets of rules. We in Brazil, we are very much attached to the multi-stakeholder model, which we implement internally, and to the concept of a single, global, safe, secure, and free internet. But we acknowledge that these ideals have been under stress. When the global internet started in the 90s, I doubt, that, I doubt that many people foresaw that 90% of global digital advertising revenues would be concentrated in just two mega platforms, or that another digital platform, nowadays the largest retail in the world, could have $11 billion in yearly profits and pay essentially no tax, or that the flow of information, criticism, and debate would be largely dependent on four or five social networks. I doubt that many people would think that the platforms would uh, consider creating their own currency, setting up the equivalent of a private intelligence service, using the combination of data accumulated on billions of individuals and the new capabilities of, inter of artificial intelligence, or establishing their own censorship boards to determine what can and cannot be said. It is this concentration of influence, power, and profit in four or five digital platforms, among other factors, that may create a reaction or a demand for the assertion of digital sovereignty in other countries and could lead to the breakup of the Internet, something that, I insist, Brazil does not want. We want a single, global, safe, secure, and free Internet. I was struck, or maybe inspired by Chancellor Merkel's positive reference, to a concept of assertion of digital sovereignty within a single global internet. It was a kind of application of German dialectics that I think would be the headline of this IGF. Maybe if there were 40 or 50 global digital platforms instead of four or five, or eight if you include the Chinese companies, and some were located in Europe, some in Asia, some in Africa, some in Latin America, then the pull for the fragmentation of the Internet would uh, be, uh, be lesser. In the early 20th century, when monopolies, oligopolies, and trusts appeared in the more dynamic industries, such as railroads, oil, or telephone, they were often broken up by the state. It was called antitrust law, and it worked fine. It led to decades of innovation and prosperity. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, dialectics. The conversations are getting interesting. Uh, Elise. Thank you. I, uh, well, from the Aetna side, of course, uh, we think it's, it's essential to have digital leadership in, in Europe and also to, to keep the trust in the internet uh, because all the services that people use today are internet based. Many of the services, the banking, the messaging, emergency, we buy online. Uh, we have a lot of, of uh, things going on uh, via internet services. So what we see is happening in, in Europe is that w I don't think we're creating more a national internet, but I think what we see is that we try to uh, regain control of the data here. So for example, what's happening in, in Germany, our host country, is that they are, uh, they are now creating Gaia, which is a cloud service that will have that uh, um, purpose to, to ensure that the data are treated with a certain uh, level of security and standards to, to, uh, to the data protection that's there. So uh, from our side, what we see is when we as, as a, a global community are looking into trade agreements and, and we do business together, we find that it's actually important to include a de free for data provisions in trade agreements because by doing this, we can ensure that the trust of the data that goes from Europe and vice versa are treated in a way that actually meets certain standards. So from our point of view, it's important that we're not creating a fragmented internet, but it's also important that we keep the trust in the internet that is in, in Europe. And you can do that, for example, by having uh, uh, trade agreements that actually have uh, provisions on free flow of data. Thank you. I, I want to, we want to get to open uh, discussion with everybody, but just we have a little bit more to do first. Uh, I note that our, our Russian colleagues are both percolating during the last uh, segment with some thoughts. So maybe you, if you uh, concisely uh, offer your thoughts on, on the, the cumulative impacts, that'd be great. Both, both of you in whatever way. Uh, so basically just a food for thought, very short. Uh, let's uh, go away from these data things and money and advertisement. And I would like to talk about national internet versus individual internet. This is what we already uh, forget about. Um, I have a fellow colleague, uh, she's a sociologist and anthropologist, uh, and she made a series of uh, field studies of how internet is used in different uh, countries, in different regions, and the practices are different. So uh, if we even make a national internet with national sites, national services, national platform and applications, people will still be using it in their own way. Um, and uh, even if it will be locked, like inside the national borders, technology developments will always outweigh this. And we see it already with the DOH protocol, right? That is completely changes how users will access sites and uh, platforms. So kind of a positive uh, hope, engineers' brains will always overweight uh, digital sovereignty of states. <laughs> Thank you for this hope, Ilona. Uh, I would also add about uh, global effects. Uh, the more sovereignty government and the states sets up over internet, the more regulations need to be implemented for a company or internet business to run in this country. So it's definitely impact. If there is no regulation related to sovereignty development of internet uh, infrastructure and services uh, will be much easier and cheaper. If, like in Russia, you require, uh, you require have a lot of compliance to sovereignty-like regulations, the global firms understand that they need to study more, and I doubt that they will come to Russia unless, well, it will be really, really money-bringing products. You know, having given uh, you two a chance, I, Professor, would you like to add anything on this particular point, to concisely, one minute? Maybe? Sure, I would like to. 
Uh, I actually don't like the notion of a national internet very much, but I think whatever it is, it's important to remove the rationales or motivations behind uh, the actions and uh, the way to do it is somehow perhaps is to pr protect perhaps the public core of the internet, treat that as a kind of a corridor of trust, uh, that nobody should damage the integrity and so on and so forth. Uh, if you write that into international law somehow, I think that might be a better uh, solution. And in addition to it, I think the powerful countries also have a lot of worries and fears because the internet provides a kind of a symmetry uh, situation. They're worried about the financial data being manipulated, drones being hijacked, and so on and so forth. So there are worries also. So uh, if we say uh, there is a kind of a digital interdependence uh, or somehow that's the right uh, departure of thought on it. So if there's a prosperity of digital economy globally, and then that will reduce the tensions in the military domain. Well, digital interdependence and sovereignty are one of the dialectics we're interested in here. Uh, Milton, why don't you take us towards the back? All right, so uh, the, the fourth segment of our uh, discussion here, and hopefully we will move very quickly now to uh, open questions, is uh, pertains to sort of the, how do we respond in internet governance to this problem of uh, sovereignty and the apparent uh, incompatibility of the global internet. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, working on this question. Uh, I've actually written a very long scholarly paper, which uh, I have a few copies here, but uh, I can give you a URL if anybody wants to actually download it. And I warn you that if you're not a scholar and you don't want to read a 15,000 word paper uh, exploring this concept in detail, then do not take this. Um, get the uh, Cliff Notes version. Um, so uh, the argument I make is that the, the protocol of the internet, because it is non-proprietary, because it is open, uh, the TCP IP, joint use of the TCP IP protocols and, and the internet protocols creates a virtual uh, territory that is not geographical territory, and therefore it is, it is contradictory and impossible to, to have uh, territorial sovereignty in cyberspace, and that we need to consider cyberspace as a global commons in the sense that we have formally recognized that in the high seas, and we have uh, also declared uh, outer space to be a place where states have actually formally recognized that they do not have sovereignty in outer space, they cannot put nuclear weapons in outer space, and so on. Um, now, what are the implications of this governance model? Well, one of the things that it does is that it formally ratifies uh, multi-stakeholder participation because uh, in a sovereignty oriented dialogue, states are privileged and the rest of us are not. And so one of the questions for people who might support uh, digital sovereignty is, you know, is that notion compatible with a uh, multi-stakeholder uh, concept? Um, another point that's, that has to be uh, emphasized here is that the, the cyberspace as a domain uh, is being declared a domain by, uh, uh, by the militaries, and particularly the military of the United States, uh, although I think other countries are imitating uh, this notion. And uh, if indeed it is a domain, then that means that states are going to compete over dominance of this domain. And so that's another reason why we want to come up with governance uh, systems that are predicated on the notion of a global commons and not view it as something that a particular government can can dominate. There's a lot of other interesting parallels between uh, ocean governance uh, in the sense that, you know, when you get closer and closer to national territory, the Im importance and significance of national sovereignty increases in the oceans, even though the high seas are themselves considered a global commons. Um, but uh, I think the, the main import of this, and I'd like to uh, use this as a point of stimulating discussion is that uh, essentially I'm arguing that there is no Hegelian uh, trick, uh, dialectical trick uh, that can be used to reconcile uh, digital sovereignty 
uh, with the global internet, that we really do have to conceive of it as a global commons, and we can't, we have to abandon notions of sovereignty in cyberspace completely and think of it more as a, as a global commons. So with that in mind, I would just notice that among our panelists, we have a very interesting observation by Ambassador Zalawar that the demand for digital uh, sovereignty comes from the concentration of market power by large players who have uh, used this globally accessible space to create uh, what he perceives as uh, an illegitimate concentration of influence, power, and profit. Uh, and the question of whether the assertion of digital sovereignty actually rectifies this or does it uh, make it worse in certain ways is, is an open one that I'd encourage us to, to debate. So now let's open it up to questions. Yeah. And, and can I say, because uh, we have a lot of people in the room, so hopefully we have a lot of questions and we have 25 minutes. Uh, can I ask that everybody, uh, would you raise your hand, say who you are, try to keep to one minute. If it's a comment, tell us that. If it's a question for somebody in particular, make that clear. Okay, we start with you here. Thank you, Bill. And this is Jorge Cancia for, uh, from Switzerland, speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, try to be brief. I think that sovereignty as a concept from the 16th century has uh, many connotations that uh, really um, are not very productive. Uh, in Switzerland, we like to uh, talk about self-determination, both in an individual sense and in a community sense, also as a nation. And uh, building walls is uh, for a small country which has an open uh, uh, economy and which is highly interconnected is no option. And uh, even if we want it and we don't want to, we couldn't, so it makes no sense. And for all small countries, that's no real option. So it would be delusionary to try to do that. And taking up the, the idea of Milton, I haven't read, uh, I have to apologize, your lengthy academic article, but let's try to, to use a bit of uh, Hegelian di and dialectics or, uh, to solve this paradox on. We think that uh, we can self-determine it as a community, as a country, with interdependence, with participation in global policy uh, dialogue. Through that participation, we can participate in co-shaping the rules of uh, the digital world. And uh, this means that we can try to go to a rule-based cooperation instead of a cooperation based or a non-cooperation based on the application of, of pure power. And that's also why in this age of interdependence we are pushing so much for making real the high-level panel uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. As a Swiss resident, all that resonated. I'm going to try to rotate around this so that I'm not just getting people from one place. So let, let me uh, take from here. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, here. Yep. And I'll come. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion here. Uh, my name is Neil Kashwaha from Canada, not representing my nation state. Uh, I, I am a uh, private sector, but advise on matters of sovereignty as it relates to cyber. And uh, although I unfortunately have not read Milton's academic uh, dissertation, <laughs> um, I, uh, I do have a, a, an interesting sta uh, statement to make of related to sovereignty, and then I'm curious, uh, I'll, I'd like to share various nation states' uh, positions on sovereignty as well. Discussion is uh, the applicability of nation state laws bring into question the interpretation of international law by various states. So in order to violate sovereignty over cyber, uh, one would likely need to violate uh, under international law the territorial integrity or impact of inherently governmental functions. So stopping a government from functioning in their regular, regular business. And that technically implies that sovereignty applies to governments and not individuals. So the discussion here is really around nation states. And um, so maybe as an example, close access cyber operations of any kind resulting in like functional damage would likely violate territorial integrity. 
uh, cyber actions causing permanent or physical damage to ICT infrastructure, uh, like permanently encrypting all your data, including backups, destroying it all, likely would violate sovereignty. And, um, but the question that we have and when we discuss is, is temporary violations, there's still causing slowdowns or port scans and stuff like that, causing harm like that. It's kind of an interesting outcome. But there's, you, you, U.S. has taken some stands on 2012. You heard Harold Coe, um, 2018, speaking as well, clarifying that, uh, you know, there is an impact to sovereignty and from the U.S. U.K. has taken a position, uh, Attorney General Wright, saying that their sovereignty is not a rule that can be violated. Um, Estonia, as well, has taken an interesting position, a little bit softer on it. And France, very strict recently with the Ministère des Armées. Um, and as well, you'll see in the UNGG reports 2013-2015 reports discussing that uh, sovereignty applies to ICT in cyberspace, uh, but some are very vague in data. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to count that as more of a comment than a question because it's, there's a lot there. We, we really need to try to stick to one minute, please, if we can, in the, to get everybody in it. Was there anybody over in, in this uh, chunk? Otherwise, I'm going to turn around uh, over here. And so, okay. Uh, yes. My name is Peter Lidov, and uh, I'm from Russia. I'm representing Sputin, Sputnik International News Agency, but I'm talking in a personal capacity. would like to mention a couple of points which I think uh, are worth uh, taking into consideration. First, there is a four page, 40 pages document uh, issued last year by the administration of President Trump in the United States, and that's uh, national national. Uh, cyber strategy, which clearly stipulates the United States' interest in not only maintaining but further developing global dominance over Internet in the interests of the United States businesses, policy, etc., etc. And not only they want to maintain and develop the dialogue and things like that, but also they clearly say that they will punish those who are defined as malicious states, namely Russia, China, and so on. We know that the malicious states, they change from time to time time could be Yugoslavia or something else. Uh, given that, uh, I think it's pretty normal that uh, every uh, country should consider adopting its own national strategy, model it from the United States, and basically uh, defend and uh, foster its own interest. And second, very short comment is about um, the notion that um, uh, is very common that without open internet, economic development will suffer. Um, here I would like to point out an example of uh, China, where, which is an example of sovereign internet from the very beginning where economic development has not only not suffered, but uh, actually has been quite on a good track, despite the fact that they are imposing probably the toughest control other than North Korea uh, worldwide. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to rotate around, as I said, so I'm going to go to the next segment over here, uh, Hans. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Hans Klein from Georgia Tech. One minute, uh, everybody, please. Uh, and this is well, one minute. I'm going to make a point of information and then a, a question. There was an earlier question about U.S. sovereignty over the Internet. We do have very explicit episodes where the U.S. did assert its sovereignty over the Internet. The most striking one was in January 1998 when Ira Magaziner, representing the President of the United States, threatened force on John Postel to do what the United States wanted him to do. So there was no, no ambiguity there. Earlier in 1997, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State of the United States, asserted sovereignty towards the ITU, and so on and so forth. So U.S. sovereignty over the Internet is absolutely clear. Uh, up to 2016, when the United States made the Sovereign Act to relinquish the Internet, but up to that point, there's, there's no ambiguity about sovereignty. Okay, question. Uh, I suggest here that Vince Cerf has uh, suggested a Hegelian synthesis that reconciles the global Internet and the fragmented Internet, and the synthesis lies in the network layers model. The Brazilian ambassador identified a number of problems with the existing Internet, profit, concentration, taxation, avoidance, civic communications, and a few platforms. Almost all these problems thus identified reside at the application layer of the internet. So if, it seems that there's some push to fragment the internet at the application layer. The internet as true engineers know, the internet is actually at a lower layer. The network of networks lies below that, and it may be possible to continue a global network of networks 
even as we break up the applications that function on that network of networks. So my question is, is this a feasible approach to addressing the problem? Thank you. Okay, the, the lady here. Bill, I asked you that there was, you were coming across, I was a second I'm person to put my hand up. To take them in sections. Okay. Don't censor call people. somebody else right next to you, I will come back to you. The lady here, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Hannah Zinne and I'm from Germany. I have a question. When you mentioned the fact that you think cyberspace should be like the high sea, at the end of that metaphor, you said, okay, but the closer that we get to the physical territory of states, the more sovereignty applies. Um, and I have two questions concerning that. The first one would be, what are exactly those elements where you would say the internet dips towards these notions of sovereignty? And I mean, for the law of the sea too, you had endless discussions among states where their sovereignty ends and where their sovereignty um, doesn't apply. How would you convince states that would argue the whole of the internet falls into their coastal territories and their coastal waters? Actual question to one person. You can come back to that. Uh, Parminder, since you were itching, go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Parminder from IT for Change. Uh, I have a high level question about, I think sovereignty should be discussed in relation to what it really is about. It's about rule of law. So when we say there shouldn't be sovereignty, what happens to the rule of law component? Because if there isn't rule of law, there is a rule of the strong, which the Brazilian uh, ambassador already alluded to. And there, is there a trade-off we are making between rule of law and certain global independences, which always works against the weaker sections? Connected point is that in the development, there's a lot of discourse about local controls and subsidiarity. So why, when in the real world, we need to take control lower and lower to the local, why should here the control migrate upwards to the global and why such an internet exceptionalism, which is connected to the rule of law question. And again, we are fine with certain non-sovereignty in certain layers of the internet, but then it gets collapsed over everything what internet does. And internet now has gone into our lives as it is said that personal data is an extension of a personal being. And if data is a part of the internet, then beings are flowing inside the internet. And if you're talking about everything should be non-sovereign, then there is a problem because for example, Windsurf said there should be free flow of data and commerce in the same breath. Free flow of commerce is highly contested in many areas by developing countries. For example, free flow of agriculture produce and many other kind of free flows which are livelihood issues. So I think we need to nuance which layer of the internet we are talking about non-sovereignty and then also what is the relation with the rule of law and the interest of weaker sections and people and countries. Thank you, Parminder. All right, so rolling along this way, Vit uh, Vittorio. Hi, Vittorio Bertola from Open Exchange. I actually have two questions, though the first one is a bit rhetorical. But, but the first one is, I mean, uh, of course, you, you had several questions related to the um, problems and damages by, uh, that happen from um, exerting national sovereignty. But shouldn't we also think of the problems that come from not exerting national sovereignty? Because the reason why in Europe we, are, we have all this talk of uh, the, uh, digital sovereignty is exactly that we have problems, uh, pretty serious problems. Uh, for example, in terms of human rights, I mean, people see their freedom of expression basically being uh, managed by these international uh, social media platforms that can close up accounts for no apparent reason and no explanation, even in, for political parties sometimes. And, and the restrictions on data flows, are, I think, are also connected to the fact that uh, we've been told uh, several times data is the new raw material for the new economy. And so uh, we, we feel treated like a, a colony, you know, you know, like a, the mining corporations went to uh, certain parts of the world, extracted the minerals and went away and took all the wealth. And, I think without that, it's the same. But the other, uh, the other question is really about what Milton was saying. We, we have a protocol that has no borders built in it, and so it's in inherently, I'd say, global. But shouldn't we uh, basically have the technology follow the societal objectives? So once we realize that there is the need for at least a certain degree of national sovereignty to be applied to, to let sovereign countries to apply rules to the internet, should the technical community rather follow this and provide technology that can actually support the exertion of a, a little degree of national sovereignty? rather than dragging the feet and saying, no, our protocols don't support it, so just go away. Okay, thank you, Vittorio. The gentleman here, please. Yes. Uh, I'm Ayo Bangia, MP from D DRC. And uh, on the side of the sovereignty, I think there's uh, the big players, as uh, USA, EU, and uh, China, they have different view, but us as African country, 
we have a concern. We still not have. We still need uh, infrastructure from uh, from you, the big players, uh, infrastructure, uh, the provider, the platform. But uh, we have something that we need also to protect is our data. We are we have data. We have users, and uh, I think in few in few years we will have more users internet user in Africa than uh, Europe and the US combined. But on top of those uh, users and data, African data, African users, companies in the US are making a lot, a lot of money and we are getting zero dollar back. And for that, we need also to see, not only speak on the sovereignty on platform level, layers, but also on data. We have to assure that even if we, we are not ready as a country to with uh, the uh, the tools, the company, the research to to make money out of the, those data, we have to make sure that those data belong and remain uh, Africa property. And the time will come when we are ready also to see how to exploit to exploit those data. And uh, for that, we need that because. Otherwise, the the digital divide will will increase not only on infrastructure but also on data coming with uh, the big data and artificial artificial intelligence and all those kind of things coming out. They need data and they are getting data most of data from Africa. So we need also to have some few money back from those data. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, there was one. I'm just going to take one more because no. I have to go. He was waving at me a lot. So please, concisely, and then we're going to go back around with the group. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Camping, 419 Consulting. Um, people, where, where, where there's been discussions about the current so-called global internet, in reality, it's uh, largely dominated by U.S. norms and standards uh, and U.S. companies. Um, and because of that, it doesn't reflect the uh, different values uh, elsewhere. Uh, so if I contrast thoughts on things like data privacy between Europe and the US, or freedom of expression, where US companies often hide behind the First Amendment to uh, resist the blocking of certain content in other jurisdictions. Um, so I think if you actually want to maintain and develop a true global internet, um, then what's needed to balance the dominant voice of U.S. tech companies um, is a lot more involvement uh, by uh, political uh, and policy participants from around the rest of the world. Um, so rather than leaving it to the technocrats, uh, the Democrats have to be in the conversation as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, go back around the table. We've got uh, about 10 minutes uh, to all the panelists to pick up on whichever the questions that were or comments that were made that you find provocative and would care to respond to. Why don't we start at this end with uh, the ambassador? Would you like to go first? Thank you. Uh, I think it should, we should all be clear that uh, if something, something unites us, it is the commitment to the multi-stakeholder model, to freedom of expression, to the protection of individual privacy, to a sensible balance between private interests and public policy concerns, and to the idea of a single global internet instead of a fragmented one. Breaking up the internet is not, reiterate, not the best solution to the problems we face today. Preventing natural monopolies from consolidating and expanding would be a better one. Uh, how to do that? Uh, I don't have a complete, complete answer. Uh, there was an article by Mike Mesnick recently called Protocols Not Platforms that may provide part of the answer, may provide the reference for those interested. Very good article this, on this year. There is also a project called Solid by Tim Berners-Lee that may also point in the right direction. I, I don't have the answer, really. We don't have a, a global forum that can take decisions about these issues. But we must try if we wish to preserve a global free internet. Maybe to avoid the breakup of the internet, governments will have to break up some digital monopolies. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Vint, you know, you're, you're actually over there, too, but I was looking down this side. But you, you're, you please. <laughs> Uh, well, 
I actually like protocols, you might imagine, uh, and I think that a lot of the problems that we have will be solvable uh, with the right set of protocols, although in this case, the protocols are more about policy than they are about um, you know, the technical mechanics of moving packets around. So the biggest challenge that I see is that there is this tension uh, at the national level to try to protect citizens from various kinds of harm. And the, there's a desire to impose where it's possible to do so a set of policies that, uh, that uh, achieve that protection. The question in my mind from an engineer's point of view is whether you can take this uh, melange of policies and find a way to make them at least interwork so that the network and the policies that, uh, that are adopted still uh, make this thing function. Uh, it's not a good uh, metaphor, but some of you will remember that the original uh, internet was designed around networks that were not compatible. And they were made compatible by adopting a common global address space and a common packet format and encapsulation and decapsulation as the traffic went back and forth through the network. So I'm trying to imagine uh, whether there is a way of uh, achieving a similar objective uh, but in the policy space. And I don't quite know how to interpret what I just said, but uh, I think that's the, the desire here is to make sure that the policies can be adopted if necessary at the national level, but which still allow the system to function on a global scale. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to respond to the question uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, who said that uh, China, from the very beginning, uh, perhaps has uh, more elements of sovereignty in, in terms of in, in, in the Internet uh, uh, stories, anyhow. Uh, I agree with that. I think I uh, agree on that point. There are, indeed, more elements in it. Uh, that's why, by the way, uh, China has a different situation from EU. EU is busy with uh, chasing the big internet platforms because those platforms are not European and uh, are somehow do not feel painful about it uh, when exercising big fines. While China, uh, the platforms are all uh, somehow Chinese. And by the way, uh, Milton also did a kind of research on it with a long article comparing how China and the United States are similar in terms of using uh, some websites and so forth in that category. So I think I agree with the, uh, uh, the Russian speaker. Thanks. Uh, Lise. Thank you. First of all, I agree we need to have a global multi-stakeholder discussion on these issues. And I, need, uh, I think we need to have all uh, stakeholders represented in these dialogues. So it's the users, it's the industries, it's the governments. We all need to, to have these discussion on how to actually establish common standards that can secure uh, a global open and, and secure internet for all. I don't think it's an easy task, and I think this dialogue is, is, uh, is a starting point, and, and we need to have it in order to not get a fragmented internet for, for the future. Uh, to, to my fellow panelists' uh, 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 remarks, one from Vint uh, Surf and also one from Iona from uh, uh, St. Petersburg University on protocols and technology, I agree, uh, technology is wonderful and we can actually do a lot with technology, but on the DOH, I, I really think we need to thread carefully here because we need to avoid uh, establishing a concentration of data on a few private companies and we need to implement a security standard that uh, is actually uh, not uh, shooting uh, uh, sparrows with cannons and, and to make sure that uh, we do it in a way so it's not, again, creating this concentration of, of data. So I'm not against uh, uh, having more secure standards and, and protocols. It's just it can also be used uh, to actually do uh, a bit of concentration instead of having uh, the internet as we have it today, uh, um, a decentralized internet. Thank you. 
Alexander. Uh, I would like to continue discussion of protocols uh, because none of internet protocols actually supports any governmental interactions. It does not support sovereignty. It does not support uh, interest of any state. And that was actually that success which led to current development of internet. Government have no mechanism, governments have no, had no mechanisms to interfere development of the internet. So sovereignty or discussion of sovereignty at the selected states is a real threat for uh, development of internet as we've seen it before. But also I want to respond to gentlemen from DRC that internet still gives a lot of possibilities for development, for development of underdeveloped countries and others. For sure, we know that some states are abusing internet for spreading uh, fake news or uh, instead of pointing to the problems of their own countries, starting discussions on uh, US cyber strategy. But internet still gives possibilities, if not talking about big platforms or their negative impact, develop internet and economy in your own country, and you will succeed. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Ilona. Thank you. Uh, I will return to the question of the UNGG and international law. Uh, it's surprisingly that states that push for cyber sovereignty, internet sovereignty, they oppose the idea of militarization of cyberspace and use it as a military domain. Uh, if you have seen the uh, discussions in the OEWG group, that is the parallel track of the NGG group, uh, Russia and China is actually pushing to against uh, militarization of cyberspace. But in this turn, uh, should we see digital sovereignty notion as a curtailed or trimmed thing without this military dimension that is kind of one of the uh, important components of the classical notion of sovereignty? Okay, Mona. I'd like to uh, address the issue of internet, uh, how to benefit from the internet in Africa. I'd like also to mention that digital platforms in developing countries play a different role than compared to developed countries. Digital platforms in developing countries create uh, many opportunities. They overcome many inefficiencies in the market, many economic inefficiencies. Uh, they uh, um, help allocate um, resources in the right way. They help, gen help generate uh, uh, job opportunities. So and this is with, only with the help of the internet and the leveraging the data uh, to promote digital platforms. This is very important in developing countries. Also for China, I think that uh, the, the, now the trend is toward um, uh, interop interoperable uh, regulatory frameworks around the world, uh, especially inspired by the GDPR. So uh, I think that China also recently, um, even if it succeeded in, uh, in reaching certain um, economic benefits uh, with, uh, with its uh, previous uh, regulations that, uh, that um, were uh, built on data localization in certain areas, but uh, recently it has it had, uh, made changes and, uh, to these regulations. And also we need to remember that China is the home of one uh, billion uh, consumers. So it's a huge market uh, in itself. So that's why it, is, uh, it has succeeded. But this is not applicable for other developing countries. Thank you. Okay, we have run out of time, so we're just gonna do closing benedictions very quickly. Uh, and uh, so, Milton. I'm not going to do a closing benediction. I'm going to try to respond to some of the points that were made. Uh, and uh, if okay. you have to filter out, uh, good luck to you all. Um, so uh, it, there are too many questions to respond to here. But uh, in general, to, I see a tendency among the critics uh, of this panel to see sovereignty as a way of counterbalancing the power of the big US companies. That really is what it comes down to. Right, And there are so many false uh, assumptions and false assertions uh, that are part of this argument. For example, the uh, false assertion that the basic internet standards are American. I thought Vint had made it quite clear that the US government does not own those standards. It does not, uh, anybody can use them. In any country, in any of the world, it's non-proprietary standard, and that's, as Alexander said, that's why it succeeded. It wasn't attached to a government. There's a false assertion that sovereignty is about the rule of law. Well, that's true historically about the domestic polity, but it's completely false internationally. 
uh, sovereignty is anarchy internationally. And I thought Bill had made that point uh, clearly. So if you think that by asserting sovereignty, you're going to counterbalance the rule of the strong, I got some news for you. And maybe uh, the guy from uh, Sputnik can uh, remind you about the Trump document uh, in which the American government is asserting its uh, ability to uh, uh, dominate cyberspace. Uh, Hans has asserted that the U.S. has asserted sovereign power over the DNS route on a couple of occasions. I got news for Hans. There was something called the IANA transition. Uh, Lisa and I were part of that, in which we formally detached uh, ICANN and the DNS route from any control by the U.S. Now, it's true that ICANN is located in the U.S. It has to be located somewhere, so in some sense it's going to be uh, in there, but uh, the DNS policy is no longer formally subject to U.S. authority. Uh, for the rest of you, I just think you need to pay attention to what actually happens when sovereignty is asserted. Do you really think Russia, North Korea, China, and Saudi Arabia and Iran are nice examples of uh, how data is only exploited for the sake of uh, the people in that country? Do you think that uh, privacy and security are actually uh, helped by these assertions of sovereignty? Or do you think this is states doing what states do, which is protect and preserve their own power? Uh, the question about the parallels between ocean governance, you know, we can take that offline and talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Well, Milton covered a little bit of what I would have touched on as well. I think some of the conversation, which I think has been very uh, interesting and robust, and I thank everybody for contributing to it, um, has drifted a bit from the topic of sovereignty, which I think is somewhat difficult to discuss in some ways. It's a, perhaps a kind of conceptual abstraction that um, is a little hard to sink your teeth into. So we've we moved into some of the broader kinds of longstanding arguments and concerns about power and which countries and which companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, have more power, et cetera. But getting to the core question of how it is that states utilize the discourse of sovereignty to justify their actions and, and to uh, provide rationales for a range of activities which may or may not be beneficial from the standpoint of preserving an open global internet is I think an important question to give further thought to. Um, obviously here we are only scratching the surface. It's a big topic and we had 90 minutes. We had a lot of people in the room. So. Um, hopefully this was at least a useful start to everybody and we'll give you some food for thought and uh, we thank you for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, okay?